Lord, um, Lord, I just thank you. I just thank you for today, and I thank you for this room full of people. I thank you for the people who are watching, Lord. I thank you for how you touch our hearts, Lord. Thank you for how much you have given us. Lord, I'm just asking that that this message be your message, not my message. That um, I'm thankful for the the opportunity and the freedom to be able to speak, but I don't want to just come up and say stories and say whatever because I have a mic. Lord, I just want what I say to be what you've been talking to me about, the things that you want um, everybody to know and hear. Uh, I believe that you're talking to me about things you want them to know, um, and they might be more revelation for me than anything. Um, but I just want to say what you say and nothing else. Amen. So I'm talking about the Lord's provision this week. Uh, I want to start, though, with Psalm 42. I'm just reading a tiny snippet of it. I have a hard time. As you well know, I have a hard time not putting in the entire chapter or the entire psalm. But I was just focusing on um, the Psalm 42, the 1 and 2, and at the end, 11. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. Oh, I might need another one. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? And then 11 is, Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the hope of my countenance and my God. So I'm going to switch mics here. Is that one still on? Okay. Um, as I've been thinking about the Lord's provision, as I've been actually wrestling with um, releasing this, I know he's brought me to it, and I've been looking at things about the Lord providing in the, in the Bible and doing word searches and, and just kind of going on those little trails that he might take you on to, I'm sure. Um, but in the process of it is a, a very real in the process of talking anytime, but really anytime I come in here is a very real um, wrestle within myself. Um, and I just want to be a little transparent that, uh, that I get distracted, that I get not just why I'm doing this, but from this. So, so I'll be reading something and I'll get distracted on bunny trails um, even trying to get to reading the Bible, I get distracted. My time will get distracted. And, and something that's been coming forth in the prayer room a lot is that the solution, the um, antidote, if you will, to distraction isn't to try and not be distracted. That's not going to work. Um, that's like telling yourself, and I think this has come up recently, uh, when you're struggling to try and get to sleep, <laughs> telling yourself, I'm still awake, go to sleep already. You know, I'm trying to sleep, I can't sleep, and you just, you can't make yourself fall asleep. There are things you can do to try and help the process or not impede the process, but really whether you sleep is not up to you. And the same thing is true to a certain amount with being distracted. Whether or not you are distracted or getting taken off or your eye is caught or you lose time on your phone or you, you're playing on the computer and ugh, there goes an hour or, you know, all of this thing, the solution to that is not to say, I'm going to stop because that will be striving and it will not produce good things even if you are successful. The, the solution is to fall more in love and to desire more and... The trick there is you can't make yourself fall more in love and you can't desire more. That's like saying, I'm going to fall asleep now. But you can ask for it. And this is, this is absolutely what the Lord wants. He wants us to ask for more of him. He wants us to ask for more love, to want to fall more in love. My kids and I, we pray, Lord, help us want to want you more. You know, not just 
help us want you more, but help us want to want you more. You know, we don't even have that without you. Um, so in that vein, when I talk about the Lord's provision, I have to realize that I have to be hungry. So this distraction thing, I have to grow closer to the Lord. I have to want him more and all of that. All of that comes from asking. But that hunger is the same thing. I can't make myself hungry. I can, to a certain extent, stop eating junk. And maybe I'll actually feel real hunger. But even that is hard to do, hard to resist. In my own strength and striving, that's really an asking for thing as well. All of it is asking for. All of it. And so I need more desire. I need more hunger. And with love, there is confidence that he will satisfy. Um, If I am just hungry and ravenous, I can be overwhelmed by that hunger and go to whatever source. But if I have confidence that, oh, I have a meal coming, like I'm hungry. And at the end of the message, and when we're done praying, I'm going to go home and eat. And so I'm like, I can be hungry for a little while. If you've ever fasted and given up food, you know I'm hungry right now, but I'm not going to be hungry forever. I've made a decision to do this. I know it's really hard to stick to it, but I've got that end goal in sight. And sometimes you even go, I am so looking forward to that steak dinner when I am done. Or whatever it is that, that you're fasting or giving up for a season. But that hunger isn't nearly so overwhelming if there's confidence that you will be fed at the end. Um, you know, when I was preparing for this message, and I didn't get any statistics because that was a bunny trail that the Lord said, you can look, but you can't, you can't keep. And that was to look a little bit at hunger in the world, and it's super hard. But basically, the desperation and the hurdy part in it, not just that people are starving and that they're young people a lot of times, um, but that they never know where it will come from. They never have assurance that they will get fed. So when they eat, it is shove it all in or hide it away for later. You know, kids in schools trying to take milk home and it leaking from their backpack because they don't have milk at home. Things like that. The, the amount of desperation that comes from not knowing that that need will be met is huge. But it's not a, that desperation is just desperation without the hope. But we have the Lord and we have the hope. We know that our hunger in him, our hunger for food, our hunger for whatever we need, that he wants to meet that and that we have to ask and then we'll receive And it might not be the fancy chocolate cake that you were imagining. It might be something a little less fancy looking than than what you had kind of pictured in your mind. But he will still meet that need. I know for my own fact that eating low fat because of health reasons, that I'm almost always on the edge of hungry. I eat, I'm like, oh, I feel so good for about 20 minutes. And then I have to wait a little while, even if I am hungry. But I know I'll get to eat again. But there's this weird um, cycle in knowing it doesn't last. You keep having to come back to it, come back to it, come back to it. I mean, we're meant to eat that way. (laughs) We're not necessarily meant to have a big meal and then go, okay, God, I got enough of you. I'm good. It's Sunday. I am full and then go through the week and go, I don't need to eat, I ate on Sunday. (laughs) That would be really painful. (laughs) You know, he actually, when we're asking for hunger and he gives us hunger, we shouldn't be so surprised when it lasts two hours and then we're ready to eat again, right? We talk about, oh, I got all filled up in the meeting and then I went home and I don't know what happened. It all broke loose and, oh, that's because we still need the Lord. We still need to be eating. It's time to eat again. Essentially, I always look at that at that moment of why is this happening? I was just full. <laughs> you know, I was just feeling the Lord and now I'm all fr- freaking out on my kids or whatever. And he's, this is you feeling hungry again. You know, you shouldn't be surprised you have to pray. Anyway, this is all just a setup for Song of Solomon. 
two. I'm just going to read three through five. Like an apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down in his shade with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to his banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with cakes of raisins. Refresh me with apples, for I am lovesick. I always like that one. I can't seem to talk about hunger without talking about satisfaction, without talking about more of the Lord, and I end up in Song of Solomon. Now, as part of my kind of regular reading, um, I came across 1 Kings 17. So if you'll turn there, then I'll, I'll explain a little bit. I, um, so in 1 Kings 17, and the Lord had me sit there and keep returning to this chapter. 1 Kings 17, read it through. I'm like, okay, what are we reading today? We're doing that again. Okay, can we read something else? Yes, after you read that. And I've been doing that a little bit. Now, I don't normally do that, so, and I'm not sure that I've gleaned the fullness of it, so I'm going to probably just be staying there until the Lord tells me otherwise. Um, but this is kind of what got me going on thinking about the Lord's provision. Um, and we're going to read about it. But we know that in addition to hunger, there is scarcity and famine all over in the earth, and it's starting to come and increase here, and it's one of the last places. Although it's been, there is some hunger that's always been here hidden, but revealing it is coming for sure here in a greater extent, and it's going to be felt all along the line, not just the least are going to feel it, but all. And we know this because the Bible tells us, <laughs> and because we're seeing it, both. Um, and it's going to increase and become more intense. And I wanted to remind myself, and I felt like the Lord was saying, remind yourself of how I am a provider, um, how I am your provider, and how he meets my needs, and who he is, and how he will continue to be my provider, and that this is an important truth to hold on to. Um, and part of it is also remembering my own personal testimonies of his provision. But let's read... Elijah 17, starting right at the beginning. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan, and it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Fabulous. I just love this. Part of it is I have had a dream where the Lord said that in the dream, Tom declared there shall be no rain. And we were actually watching for it. It's a, it's a weird thing to do that kind of a thing, to share that, to hear the word of the Lord say there shall be no rain and to watch for it. Um, I think it's interesting. We're talking a lot about prophetic release. I think I get all confused because I go to different meetings and they have different flavors, but I know that releasing prophecy has been coming out. And of course, on Saturday, we were just singing about it. So I really feel steeped in the idea of how to release prophecy or that it's important to release it. And of course, we've been speaking, speak truth and love for a while here. And of course, listening to the Lord in that, sharing what he says, and that is the prophecy. So he does this. And then the word of the Lord came to him and says, get away from here. So the Lord tells him to leave. And he does, and he says, I'm going to provide for you. You shall drink from the brook, and I'll command the ravens to feed you. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. Love that. And for he went and stayed at the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. Just the image of that. Like, how in the world? <laughs> it's awesome. And then it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. This is the very thing he had prophesied. That's added. <laughs> if you're reading along with me, I should pause. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, this is the Lord's protection in this moment. He gives the word, tells the prophecy, 
tells what he's been hearing from the Lord in truth, in love, speaks it out, and then the Lord takes him to a place he obeys and provides for him there. It's his protection. Next section is um, 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a window there, a widow there, to provide for you. So he rose and went to Zareph, Zarephath, and then he came to the gate of the city. Indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water and a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he calls her and says, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And so she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of these sticks that I might go and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. So here we have, the Lord says, go, you're going to find a widow. She is going to provide for you. He sees a widow. He says, can I have a drink of water? She says, goes to get it. He says, and by the way, just a little bread. And finds out, oh, well, the last bit that I have of everything, I was going to make for my son and I, and we're just going to die. <laughs> and that's the person who's going to provide for him that the Lord set up to provide for him. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but I'm still asking for that little piece of bread. But make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me, and afterward make some for yourself and your son. And I'm wondering what this woman is doing in her mind, thinking, I just told you I didn't have to make one, and we were going to die. I don't know. I don't know. But somehow... And what he has faith enough, and he knows what the Lord said, that he can even say to her, I'm going to ask that last bit of yours too. He's like, God told me, I trust him, he's going to provide, he said he was going to provide, you know, and she's like, okay, then what have I got to lose, <laughs> right? I'm just going to die anyway. She does. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, Afterward, make some for your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and her household ate for many days. And the bin of flour was not used up, nor the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to Elijah. According to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to the Elijah. Provision. Says the Lord providing. This is what I'm going to have you do. This is what I'm going to have happen. You do what I set before you. Let me deal with how all this works. I'll even tell you how it's going to work. I'll even tell you it will not run out until. And then you have to trust it. And then she has to trust it. And her faith is in what he did, what he said. She goes and, her, and did according to the word of Elijah. She didn't hear from the Lord herself, but she heard him. He heard the Lord, and she believed it, and she did it. And their whole household ate for many days. Provision. First one was protection. This one's provision. And then Elijah revives the widow's son is the next section. I wasn't reading the headings, but there you go. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick, and his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, What have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? And he said to her, Give me your son. So he took him out of the arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his own bed. And then he cried out to the Lord and said, Oh my God, have you also brought tragedy, tragedy on the widow with whom I lodged by killing her son? Okay, we talked about food, God. You said you provided and you did that. You were so good to do that. What is with the son? Right? Well, and I think it's so meaningful here that here when she says, what have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to bring my sins to remembrance? She has a life before this incident that we don't know. But when she sees her son die, she thinks, you're calling that all 
into payment now. And, and this is understandably the result of what I have done. And he, we'll go down there, and he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah in that prayer. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now, by this I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. Not by being fed. Not by being fed. By this I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth is the truth. This, the truth in love. This is the truth in love. And this is resurrection. This is resurrection. Now, I kept thinking about this and talking to the Lord about it. And I felt like he gave me protection, provision, and resurrection for those three sections. And I kept going, okay, I'm not sure about the resurrection one. I mean, that's sort of, I don't know. But he, I feel like that's from the Lord, that there is something in the truth, in revealing the truth, that brings life. All right, so let's go to Jonah 4, 4 for a moment. So Jonah 4, 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So just a reminder, he came. He, well, he didn't come willingly at first, but then he came and warned the people that the Lord was going to judge them, and they turned and repented, and then he lifted that judgment. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. He became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, oh, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in the country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. So Jonah got who God was. He, he, he had an understanding of the Lord as provider. He had an understanding as him gracious and merciful, but he didn't have his heart. He didn't understand that the Lord loved these people, that he loves all of us, and that, that all of this, all of this prophecy, all of this judgment, it's all to try and get repentance. And he did not get that. And he's like, it would be better for me if to die than to live. He's really speaking that over himself right there. It would be better for me to choose death than to choose your life because your life is hard. Your life doesn't agree with what I say. Your life is different than I thought. And the Lord doesn't stop there. Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. So he's still looking for God to change his mind and bring judgment down in that city. He's still looking. He's still looking. And the Lord God prepared a plant, made it to cover over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. Jonah. Is it right for you to be angry? Get my heart. Get my heart. Look, even while you're angry and over here on this mountain waiting to do this thing that I said I'm not going to do because this was the whole point all along, I'm still giving you a little shade. I'm trying to bring you a little comfort from your misery. I'm trying to woo you back because I love you. And so Jonah was very grateful for the plant. Thanks for the plant, Lord. But as morning died the next day, God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun rose that God prepared a vehement, vehement, I can't say the word, 
vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint, and he wished death for himself and said, it's better for me to die than to live, Jonah. (laughs) He's wooing you. He woos you with the provision and the removal of it, both. And then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. But the Lord said, you have pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? That is the end of that story. But what we get from it is that it matters what is going on in our heart. God is serious about loving others, about us loving others, about loving our neighbor, about loving our enemies. And we have to agree with his heart or we will become offended. Jen recently shared an image of ravenous wolves coming into the congregation, and also uh, the idea of uh, like people so desperate they'd be willing to sell their grandmother for a touch of the Holy Spirit or something that they feel like that they could receive. When the outpouring comes, there will be people who come in so hungry, so very hungry, that they throw all caution, they throw it all to the wind, they don't take any care for the people around them because they are starving, they're desperate. But we were just seeing on Saturday um, from 1 Corinthians 14 about the Lord not being the author of confusion, but of peace. And that order comes from the previous chapter where it talked about love, love, loving each other. Love is not this, it's not that, it's not boastful, it's not prideful, it's not, that's what love is. And right after is prophecy, but it doesn't come all crazy because the first thing is established. And serving each other is that love. So serving each other in the meeting. So yes, there will be people who come in, there will be ravenous wolves, that I believe is a prophetic warning of the Lord. Um, And we have an opportunity with the Lord to really get his heart and really get serving and really get that unity that comes from loving each other so we can help them. So we can say to Nineveh, destruction is coming. So we can actually go, all right, um, I love you. I'm saying the truth in love. We're hungry. I get it. We're all hungry here. And we do need more closeness to the Lord, but we can't, we can't push each other out of the way to get it because then we don't get the Lord. We get something else. All right. I'm going to take us briefly to Job. You can follow me if you want. I'm only there for like three segments. I'm saying this in faith because I don't completely see how it connects in. Um, Part of what the Lord showed me, this is Job 38, part of what the Lord showed me is that, um, and he did it in just getting ready, getting dressed for today, getting, you know, thinking about these notes. I can see that they're not as orderly as I would like. I can see that they don't flow from one thought to another thought and lead us all on a little merry um, thought, you know, make a, a complete picture. The, the cake, if you did it in this order, might not rise, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And I can see it. And he also, like, even in getting dressed, he's like, there's, there's a... There's a whole gamut of my wardrobe that goes from more slick and polished to more comfy and cozy. And, and I, you know, I felt like I have to start being more me and less slick of polish. So we get these notes. And the Lord gets all the glory. So 
because I don't get the glory for leading you on a little merry, logical procession that would read like a book or something. Job 38, 39, can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lurk in their lairs to lie in wait? This is 39 through 41. Who provides food for the ravens when its young ones cry to God and wander about for lack of food? This is the he provides. So let's talk about where that comes from. Okay, what word do we know? Possibly. Who knows a word, a name of God, kind of an identity for the Lord provides? Yeah. Um, good job. Points, points from the congregation. Jehovah Jireh, I've heard it. Okay. The Lord will provide or the Lord provides. So if, if you do a little research, we're going to go to Genesis 22, where that name is spoken by Abraham. Genesis twenty two twelve says, Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. This is him at the top of the mountain. Isaac carried him up. In fact, on the way up, Isaac says, Um, I think we're forgetting the sacrifice. And he's like, The Lord will provide. And then he binds him and lays him down. And it's really clear Isaac is the sacrifice. And the Lord says, Don't. Don't lay a hand. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns, and he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called this place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Um, if we look at that word, so uh, if you do it in, I went to the Blue Letter Bible. So, and Abraham called the place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to the day in the mountain of the Lord, it shall be seen. So if you look up the word for provided, you get H7200. And it is Ra'ah, Jehovah Jireh. So Jireh there is Ra'ah, which shows up in the following manner, like 879 times, it means see. 104 times see, like with your eyes. Look, 104 times look. Behold, 83 times. Shoe, as in to show, I suppose. 68 times. Appear, 66 times. Consider, 22 times. Spy, 6 times. Respect, Five times, perceive five times, you get this, look, see, right? And provide four times in this moment, which is why it is um, the Lord, it shall be seen in the other translation with that word 7200, ra'ah, which I don't know how many of you remember Paul giving a message about ro'i, which was the message of uh, Hagar going out into the desert, desperate, and he was the Lord, God who sees, Ro'i, that's 7210. It comes from the root word, 7200. Ro'i, the Lord God who sees, comes from the root word of uh, Ra'a, which is Jaira. So, that, that Roe, sight, again, to look at, to see. And then we know in that passage, and she called the name of the Lord that spoke to her, that's in Genesis 16, 13. Thou, God, seest me. So that's the 7210 Roe. As she said, have I also here looked after him, and the, after him that seeth me. Again, he, she uses that the God who sees me. This is Hagar, right, who's pregnant, fleeing from Sarai with Ishmael in the desert, and the Lord meets her there, and that's her response to him. And then another translation is of the New King James, actually. Uh, then God called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are the God who sees, for she said, have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore the well was called Bir Lahai Roi, 
well of the one who, who lives and sees me. That um, provided word, one of the other four times that it's used that way, uh, as provided as opposed to sees, is in 1 Samuel 16.1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing as I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. That's that same word there. Jaira. In Genesis 21, 16 through 19, this is again Hagar so in this section, I just read it. Then she went and would sat down across from him at a distance or of about a bow shot. This is across from her son. For she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. So before she was pregnant and now she is, has a child. She goes back into the desert. So she sat opposite him and lifted her voice and wept. And God heard her, the voice of the lad. And then the angel of God came to Hagar, called to Hagar out of the heavens and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. And that God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. So he provides water for her there and hope and a destiny for her son, so much more than she was you know, I mean, all the things she needed, all the things she longed for, he provided. Um, you don't have to turn there. You probably know it. Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. So provision is not just about food. We talked about it a little bit at the beginning. But like the widow had baked the cake for Elijah, there's the food. And God providing for food from the ravens and stuff. But, and him providing for her as well food. But it's also provision for Abraham uh, was God providing the sacrifice of, for himself instead of his son Isaac. For Hagar, it was hope, what we just read, destiny for her son and also water. The Lord provided for Jonah shade and gentle correction. For Samuel, it was a king he provided. And what they all show is that God is compassionate. He's the one who sees, and all provision comes from him. Really, everything we have comes from him, and we often think, we often lose sight of that. So let's go to, when you think about provision, and you think about Jesus, let's go to Mark 6, 31. I need to drink water. And he said to them, Come aside by yourself to a deserted place and rest a while, for there are many coming and going. And they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. But the multitude saw them departing, and many knew him and ran there on foot from all the cities. And they arrived before them and came together to him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them, because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country with villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And then they found out, when they found out, five, they said, five and two fishes. And then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. And so they sat down in ranks in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled. And then they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. I really, 
appreciate that we have been praying in the prayer room off and on this whole time about multiplication of resources. Um, yeah. Also, I'm going to read the Mark 8, 1 through 10 account. So a little bit further. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come from afar. And then his disciples answered him, How can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? And asked them, how many loaves do you have? He asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. So he commanded the multitude, sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And they set them before the multitude. They also had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he set them also before them. So they ate and were filled, and they took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. Now those who had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. Immediately got into the boat with his disciples and came to the region of Thalmanutha. Okay, so Jesus calls us, what do you have? He says, you feed them. What do you have? They give it to him. He breaks it, blesses it. He gives it back. They pass it around, and it is multiplied. Um, where I stumble into striving is thinking, okay, what do I got that I need to give away? And how do I meet their need? Hmm. So I really am thankful for the prayer room, because on Friday morning, um, Tom prayed something along the line. I don't have the words right. But it had something to do with asking the Lord that I not give to the people from this need of trying to fix, um, but that I give to you and let you multiply and feed the people. And I hope I didn't misrepresent you, but it really was important for me to hear that because I, as I'm learning about provision, I'm also learning that he has something for us to do. He has given us something. That a lot of provision comes from, you have a little bit of flour, make a cake right? Uh, it, you've got some bread. Give it out. Break it. Bless it. Break it out. But you cannot remove the Lord from this equation. You, you cannot. And it is miraculous. It is miraculous. Yes, that's all I'm going to say on that point. I don't want to bring up a whole different theology. But it is miraculous. Okay. So don't enter into striving into this. Give it to God. Let him multiply. These two stories do show, Jesus, or do share that Jesus is showing the disciples how to take what they're given, give thanks for it, bless it, give it back to him, right? Let him bless it, and then share it out. So it is a lesson here, but part of the lesson isn't just the take what you're given and give it, but it's give it back to him, let him bless it, multiply it. Um, there's another time, John 21, 1 through 13. Lord provides. After these things, Jesus shows himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two of others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we're going with you also. They went out, immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. When the morning had come now, had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. This is after his death and resurrection. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you, had, have you any food? And they answered him, No, no. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. I know how this works. I know you who provides. 
I remember this. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. And Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. And Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread, gave it to them, and likewise the fish. Do you have anything to eat, guys? Matthew 7, or just bouncing around, good for you, 7-7, seven, seven. ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you, for everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and him who knocks it will be opened, or what man is there among you, if his son asks for bread will give him a stone, or if he asks for a ship, ship fish will give him a serpent, And if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do to them also, for this is the law and the prophets. I'm going to keep going, even though mine has a little break, because I think it's part of it. Enter the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way in which leads to life. And there are few who find it. All right. So, in Matthew 6, in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, it says, give us this day our daily bread. And then we've seen that with these other provision stories that you're called to do something with what you're given. And you have to be in a conversation with the Lord. Don't just do, but as he moves our hearts, we'll become more like the Acts 2 church. So let's turn to Acts 2, 42. This is after the Holy Spirit has broken out and Peter has taught. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And then fear came upon every soul, and many wondered, and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And Acts 3, 4 through 10. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave him his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And then Peter said, said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by his right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he leapt up, stood and walked, and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. We're being called to this. So we're asking for provision. And we might be asked to make a little cake with the last of it. We might be asked to go run to the edge of a river and let the ravens feed us. But we're all asked to have a conversation with the Lord to see what it looks like and to do whatever he tells us to do. And it might look like sharing everything amongst each other. And it will look like that somehow. Um, And it will look like um, I, maybe I don't have that, but I do have this. And I'm, I have this, and I'm going to give it to you. And I trust that if he tells me to give it, then he will meet that need in me. 
And he's proved it again and again. There are countless stories of provision in the Bible, especially if you open up to more than just food. Really, the entire Bible is provision. I thought it was really interesting that as I was thinking about provision, I even thought of, um, I'm picking up music. So uh, provisions, which the very first prayer this morning that Sam prayed uh, was that she had said, you made really messy provisions for us to be able to come back to you because you knew us. I was like, oh, there's that word again. I'm talking about providing, the Lord providing, and he also makes, you know, how he provides for us, and the word provisions. I was like, well, I don't have a way to work that in, Lord, and then Sam did it. Well, you did it through Sam, Lord. But, um, Matthew 25. 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents beside them. And his Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents besides that. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. In Matthew 23, 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the he- king- kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Along with provision comes the understanding that if we are given something, that we need to ask him what to do with it. And it, there is a cost for all this giving. It's a good thing to receive from the Lord, but it's sober, and we can't keep it for ourselves and hold it and lock it and shove it, and we can't prevent others from getting, and we have to go in fully with that. Paul prayed on Friday, too, um, just as you are attentive to our needs, let us be attentive to the needs of others, to others' needs. And then I thought it was really interesting. So I'm sharing people's prayers because in addition to these prayers, there was prayers, I think Tom prayed, um, there, that, that we might learn from praying from the prayer room, not from the pulpit. So I'm just giving you a taste of some of the things that were already prayed in here, that all of this message is already here, um, and I'm just condensing it for you this Sunday, some of it. Because I wasn't everywhere, so I missed a bunch of it, too. Um, But Sam had prayed about money for the temple coming from an offering of love. She was praying about how when they built it, it was from an offering of love. Okay. I'm going to go back to 2 Kings. You can if you want to. I'm almost done. A certain 2 Kings 4, a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me what you have in the house. And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. And then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you just shut the door behind you and your sons and then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons and who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there's not another vessel. So the oil ceased. And then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debt, you and your sons. 
live on the rest. So when there were no more vessels, that ceased. All right. This is the last one. Luke 12, 43. Blessed is that servant, uh, 12, 43, yeah. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find doing um, when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler of all he has. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his company, coming and begins to be his male and female servant and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself to do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given from him much will be required, and you much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. So I just want to end with this, that the Lord, when I asked him what he wanted to say to you, he said, tell them, I'm not done with you yet. I'm not done with you yet, he said, which is both a promise and a warning, but it's a promise mostly. So, Lord, I just thank you. Uh, You are our provider. Really, all that we have comes from you. Each breath, each heartbeat that comes from you, um, any food that we have, where we live, it all comes from you. Our talents, our abilities, the time we've even spent, it comes from you. The time we've spent growing our abilities comes from you. Lord, we don't want to waste anything. We know the time is short. We want to... Listen to you, what you have to say, and do what you have given us to do for this day. And keep eating, keep hungering, keep coming before you, having that conversation over and over. Lord, um, I just bind distractions in the name of Jesus that are coming against all of us. I just say, Lord, you, I want to be so full of love for you. I want to be so full of love for you, and I need you to pour it in me, that hunger for love, that desire. When you touch my heart with love, I am changed, and I feel it, and I know it, and I remember it, Lord. So I ask for more love, more love for you, more love for each other, to be able to see each other the way you see, to have your heart for each other, and to take whatever little thing we have, to ask you what to do with it, to have a conversation, and to trust you to be our provider and meet all our needs. Amen.